my area, we did, we did the longest serving Republican on Capitol Hill uh, when I was in high school. Um, my, that seat was formerly held by Donald Rumsfeld. And it really got me thinking about this unique concept of party and ideology. Does the person who represents the seat necessarily represent the ideas of the constituents? And how does the congressman explain their votes on pieces of legislation to constituents in a meaningful way that comport, uh, you know, comports with their ideology? Um, so this is the electoral map that we have seen in 2006. Uh, 2006, if a blue or a Democrat, rather a Republican, light blue or a, a light blue district, the Democrats picked up. Uh, Democrats gained the majority in the House of Representatives. And then we see further Democratic expansion in 2008, particularly in the West and in the Midwest um, and in the South. So just watch 2006, 2008. 2006, 2008. And what we saw was expansion in the three caucuses of the House of Representatives. The New Democrats are very neoliberal, which is tend to favor free trade policies. The Blue Dog Democrats, which is the group I'm particularly interested in, um, is the group that uh, favors balanced budget proposals, therefore fiscal pay-go measures. They want to make sure that Congress can pass bills that they can actually pay for. Um, and that the uh, Progressive Caucus tends to favor more, uh, tends to favor more uh, progressive-looking legislation and more liberal. They are liberal. Uh, they uh, favor uh, fair trade policies and uh, the inclusion of workers' rights and standards. And we see it uh, in the years the Democrats picked up the majority, obviously there was expansion in all three coalitions in Congress. But the geography tells a lot about the coalition. It tells a little bit about the uh, ideals of the individual coalition. We see disproportionate Southern representation among the Blue Dog Coalition. And we also see uh, Western representation among the Blue Dog and that really does have implications for the policy that's going to be advocated by those coalitions. So uh, over to you here, I'm just going to go over the research questions. Um, uh, there's two methodologies. This is part of a hundred-page thesis. Some this is an executive summary um, uh, of contents analysis and the data analysis. And um, I'm going to give you some theoretical frameworks for understanding this. The research questions in this thesis, um, there are really two very broad ones. Um, what to, uh, to what extent do constituency policy preferences affect Blue Dog decision making? And then from that, how do congressmen in marginal districts explain highly salient, highly controversial votes? So the first methodology examined 62 or 64 variables, um, all compiled from various government and non-government reporting sources. Um, this <laughs> for every single Democrat in the House of Representatives. Um, and from these uh, variables, we can gather information about specific constituency information, demographic variables, demographic information. Um, just understand the context that each constituent or each dem uh, each caucus operates within. And what we find is definitely differences in terms of the electoral consequences and circumstances of the Congress members who uh, who are in. We can see that in 2004, progressives felt that they were elected in uh, much more safe districts, and just in terms of the means. And uh, New Democrats are in the middle. And Blue Dogs, um, you can see that um, they came from districts that split ticket voted. And in fact, the trend continued, even though Barack Obama um, expanded his, uh, he, he performed particularly well in many congressional districts. We see that in 2008, still uh, John McCain. It's 11 o'clock. So, Set up some theoretical frameworks. Uh, we start with Anthony Dowling's concept of uh, democracy. And in 1957, he proposed that individuals do not vote based on the, uh, you're not voting based on the in, uh, individual, they vote, they vote based on a party preference. So which, which party is going to deliver me the most uh, benefit? And they vote based on the differential. So the Democrats are going to deliver me what is in my uh, best interest, my self-benefit, <clears throat> then um, they are going to uh, vote for that. Um, David Mayhew expanded on that a little bit. He said that, well, not necessarily. Actually, it's the individual member of Congress. It is their individual incentive to get reelected to Congress, and that is why they vote uh, in particular, particular ways on legislation. Um, and they do that through individualizing themselves. So they try to make themselves stick out in Congress, and they do this through three ways. They either advertise, credit claim, or position data. And I just took three snapshots of my congresswoman's website, and you see all three enumerated right on the website. This shows that Congresswoman Melissa Bean uh, listens to constituents. Uh, she's advertising herself as 
open and transparent. But, and she's also fiscally responsible. These are three just screenshots. Fiscally responsible. And uh, promoting small business. She's taking positions, she's, adver she's advertising herself, she's saying this is me within the broader uh, scope of the whole. Uh, John Kingdon conducted interviews with almost every member of the 92nd Congress. Uh, they tried to quantitate, uh, tried to quantify the um, variables that impact congressional decision making. So we looked at, well, how did you vote and why did you vote that way and what factors influenced your vote? Um, and this, uh, this is my content analysis, so I wanted to look specifically at press releases that uh, discuss this. Um, he said that congressmen actually vote on uh, this idea of they're supporting coalitions. So who is it that voted for me? And that is who I'm going to uh, gear my, uh, my vote toward. So my supporting coalition, the people who elected me, those are the people who I should actually vote uh, to go to. And when there is nothing in my way of my field of forces and deciding how I'm going to vote, um, there's a consensus mode of decision making. And finally, Richard Fenno said, well, hey, let's not, let's take this analysis out of Washington, D.C. The analysis actually should be on congressmen's individual home styles in their congressional districts. We should not be focusing always, you know, political science literature is long focused on how congressmen vote, but it doesn't, under, it doesn't articulate why they vote a certain way. You know, how do they articulate their votes in, uh, in their congressional districts? And so he said there's four concentric constituencies, the broadest of which is the geographic, narrowing down their primary constituency, um, their re-election constituency, and their intimates, which are their family and intimates and friends, and as I talked about many of them. And he also said that congressmen are always uncertain about whether or not they're going to get reelected because they never know who's going to be on in the next election. And so building on this idea of the individual congressman is always constantly uncertain. So the methodology, um, in, terms of the pre uh, in terms of the content analysis, it examined one hundred, so far uh, 123 progressive and um, blue dog uh, press releases. I chose press releases because they're the most consistent form of release um, that we can uh, generate. Um, you know, sometimes congressmen will like, give an interview to a local paper or talk on a radio station. You know, there's a lot of variability, so I tried to create as much consistency as I can. Um, and I'm analyzing for four particular areas based on the literature. Uh, the preferred policy outcomes, they articulate, they articulate why they voted for particular <coughs> legislation. The adverse extra extraneous policy outcomes. The appeals to constituent and non-constituent entities. And the frequently cited statistics. So this is the cap and trade bill. Uh, the American Clean Energy and Security Act would establish a cap, our carbon emissions cap and trade program in the United States, um, similar to uh, other countries, that would um, create a carbon emissions market. Um, so co uh, companies like the derivative, in the form of the derivative, would have to buy and sell carbon emissions on the, on the open market. The point here is not the policy, but it's actually the way the vote broke down on uh, June 26 of 2009, last summer. Um, you see that the majority of blue dogs voted against that measure. Uh, while the vast majority of uh, progressives voted for it, and New Democrats were somewhere in between. And here's why. Um, just to try to get an understanding of it, um, this is and it's selective and very preliminary. Uh, many said that, uh, many of the progressives said that this bill is going to create jobs. Uh, many of the blue dogs said that, well, it's going to create a clean energy economy. Um, it's going to uh, strengthen our national security by making the United States more energy independent. Um, and you can see concern among blue dogs for uh, increasing the constituent hardship and the regional inequity within the bill. So it hurts Iowa uh, or uh, Idaho uh, ranchers or farmers or uh, cattle farmers. Uh, in some way, their offsets that were offered were not exactly uh, amenable to the coalition. And then when you look at what specifically influenced the congressman's decision, Many of the Blue Dogs said it was an amendment in the bill that made them vote for it. Because even the Blue Dogs who said, okay, I'm going to vote for this legislation, there was a lot more hesitancy in their press releases than among the progressives. In fact, the progressives were very uniformly, this is our message, this is what we're sticking to, we don't have to justify it to anybody. The Blue Dogs um, have to really go to great lengths to explain, this is how I came about my decision, and this is why I voted. And for many of them, it was this amendment in the bill allowed them to vote for it. One specific one allowed for um, the offset, uh, well, allowed for farmers and ranchers to get offsets. And sometimes they would say that this was meant to deliver jobs to local, um, uh, to local industry. Um, 
some way this goal is going to deliver benefits to the district. And then you've incited the Center for American Progress study, which did um, a very specific analysis of that. Um, so this idea of vocalizing and, and individualizing is very prevalent um, even in this uh, research. Um, just briefly, the limitations of this research um, involve uh, the fact that the data was based on the 2000 census um, and that uh, you know, the Islanders is also turned on census data, I'm not citing it, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, uh, and that, uh, you know, it is only a press, you know, we're recalling we're talking about press releases. Sometimes the city of Mary, we're talking about a district like South uh, Dakota, they might not put out a press release because, well, how many media outlets are in South Dakota? That's kind of the point of the press release. Um, so, you have that. And, um, overall, in terms of this idea of marginality hypothesis, so whether or not marginality influences congressional voting decisions. Uh, to be honest, there were no significant differences in the types of districts that congressmen represent. Um, in general, blue dogs tend to be more rural. Progressives tend to represent more urban constituencies. In general, um, the constituency uh, income demographics were not really similar. Um, inevitably, we're talking about fine policy details, which are either attributable to individual ideological uh, dispositions or Overall, my finding um, is going to end up being that um, Blue Dog Democrats are more accountable to their constituencies or their considered constituencies more often uh, as a result of their electoral circumstances, and that um, they have to consider constituency a lot more because people are paying more attention to those that some progressives may not consider to be 